Okay, so um, uh, it is uh, my big pleasure uh, to uh, to introduce um, to introduce Alessandro Bonatti, uh, who will be presenting a paper on data competition in digital platforms. Uh, Alessandro is an associate professor at uh, at MIT in Applied Economics Group. Uh, he's been there for a while after uh, getting his PhD in economics from Yale. Um, and he has been doing great uh, work uh, on uh, dynamic incentives on, apologies, <clears throat> uh, on dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic incentives uh, and on information in online markets. So in this, uh, you know, he's, he's done a lot of, uh, provided a lot of important contributions in those fields as published in uh, many papers in top journals. So I'm very excited that he's, uh, he's taking, uh, taking on the data questions uh, in his research. And I'm looking forward to learning, uh, you know, more new insights from this talk. Uh, so now, Alessandro, you will have 40 to 45 minutes. I will be keeping track and I will be monitoring um, monitoring uh, um, a, a chat for questions, uh, after which uh, the discussion will have five minutes and the rest we can spend uh, discussing more generally. Um, so Alessandro, please take it away. Oh. Thank you, Anna, for the uh, over-the-top introduction, and uh, thanks, Julian, for putting this together and, uh, and inviting me. Um, and this is joint work with Dirk, uh, who is in the audience somewhere. Uh, if you have questions at any point, you could put them in the chat, and, um, and maybe Dirk would uh, chime in. But honestly, I prefer if you just unmuted yourselves and, um, and asked them directly. Um, the uh, project that I'm excited to present is um, obviously on the role of uh, data in uh, the internet economy and on large digital platforms. Uh, this is a very active area in um, IO both theory and empirics. Uh, it's an active area of Dirk and my you know, research agenda. This project is uh, significantly uh, early stage, right? So as a result, uh, I may not have you know, many answers to your question. I definitely do not have all the analytical results that I wish I did, but I'm very happy to, uh, to share this with you. And a consequence of this uh, caveat is that I owe a huge amount of thanks to uh, Vasiliki, who's going to uh, discuss it and who had to work with very uh, limited time uh, and material. The, uh, the background for, the, for this project is, as you all know, the unprecedented collection and commercial use of individual data, largely by digital platforms uh, in the US, but uh, at least as much uh, in China. Um, at a broad level, uh, large platforms promise to create more value by matching consumers and products and services, but also introduce the potential for the exploitation of consumer data in uh, uh, legal, illegal ways, contract-based uh, leakages, or in, in the more canonical price discrimination sense. Um, where does this project fit in? It fits into uh, a question that Dirk and I are really interested in, which is how do different modes of data governance affect the creation and distribution of surplus on these platforms. Uh, for today, I'll just be defining data governance as the mechanisms by which platformers are capable and allowed to collect and transfer uh, consumer data. So, so take it as a, uh, with a broad definition. The question is relevant for uh, regulatory reasons. If you think about the GDPR and the Californian Privacy Rights Act, it's relevant for technological reasons as we can integrate more sources of data. Uh, it's relevant for strategic reasons. If you think about Google's uh, flock or federated learning based uh, proposal of preserving uh, consumers privacy, getting rid of cookies, um, and that type of, um, of research. In, let, let me just say that in earlier work um, uh, by Dirk myself, as, as well as many others, um, we showed that a simple policy that assigns um, ownership and control rights to consumers over their data is insufficient to bring about the efficient allocation of consumer information online. Okay? So, so that kind of goes to show that this is a relevant question for economic theory as well. With that background, what we want to do today is provide a model of important parts of the internet economy um, with a few key features. Uh, one is that platforms monetize the data through ad auctions, which is by and large the, uh, the modal way of um, of making money based on consumers' data. 
and where uh, different privacy regimes can be compared in the model sort of on a, on a level playing field. Um, the two key elements of the trade-offs, as, as you will see over and over again, are that um, owning superior information allows a platform to improve a match quality, but information also is going to create the um, potential for a very realistic and particular form of price discrimination, which is product steering. Okay? No two consumers pay uh, different prices from the same good, but different consumers might be shown different goods uh, with different, uh, say, markups. Okay. At the same time, uh, we want to be mindful of the fact that the presence of direct sales channels, for example, online or offline as they may be, are going to serve as restraints for this form of price discrimination um, if there are sort of offers that all consumers can access. So these are the, uh, the broad themes that we want to uh, get out of a model of this sort. Uh, I know I have been vague uh, at this level, but let me just place this uh, incompletely in the literature. Okay, so if your paper is not up there, it's not a strategic choice on my part. You know, just just let me know uh, what we need to read. Um, the common thread that we have with these data externalities in our earlier work is going to be that um, a consumer's decision to participate on a platform affects other consumers' outside options. Okay, so this was done in, in, in different formal ways by a bunch of different papers, but it's, it's going to be still present. More directly, the paper is going to connect to uh, papers on showrooming, like uh, Julian and Chengsi's, like Heskey's paper next, actually, uh, and, uh, uh, and many others um, in the room. Um, I didn't put down papers on information structures in auctions, including some by Dirk on nonlinear pricing, including some by me. Uh, but I will flag that while I won't have anything to say today about self-preferencing, I do think that the model is uh, suitable to that analysis, and we're seeing a uh, proliferation of papers looking at essentially Amazon in, in this on this lens, uh, including four on the market uh, this uh, this winter. Okay, so so this is a very active area both for us and um, and for others. All right, um, what's the model? Okay. We're going to consider um, a finite set of J uh, differentiated. Um, product sellers uh, who can each offer a product line, a menu of different quality levels. They have a quadratic cost of producing quality. There's a unit mass of consumers. Each consumer has a type in RJ. So really each consumer's type theta is a vector where each element of the vector is the marginal utility of buying a product of quality Q from a given firm J. So that's where the differentiation is coming from. Um, today, though not in the um, maybe I'll get to it at the end. Uh, a fraction lambda of these consumers is going to use a digital platform, a fraction one minus lambda is going to buy off the platform. What does the platform do? Well, they run an ad auction. It's going to be a very simple second price auction to match each consumer to a single seller. And uh, the remaining consumers, I'll probably have to say offline instead of off platform every time, but they just do not use the platform. It could be the, the website of, of each seller. Please, if you have questions on the setup or, or the connections, just, just ask. Okay, otherwise I'll um, I'll keep going. Now, um, what what's the story with quality that that sort of slipped in quickly? Like, was there something you talked about before? I think was it quality. I, I just want to allow these sellers to offer different product lines rather than a single good uh, to capture the product steering phenomenon by which I might want to. Um, you know, discriminating prices between you and me, not by charging us two and three for the same product, but by nudging us towards a higher or lower quality product that come at different okay. prices. Okay, so, so that's where the, thanks, Esky. So, so that's where the, um, uh, the, the second degree price discrimination aspect uh, is useful. Okay? We believe that's, I, I, you know, obviously interesting, but also a more realistic, no, no, I know, <laughs> but also a more realistic version of, um, Surplus distribution, surplus extraction online. Now, the consumer's valuations, you know, the, the Musa Rosen theta in the theta times Q, the, those are going to be assumed for now independent uh, across both consumers and firms with uh, marginal distribution F. What about the information structure in this, in this economy? The platform is going to know theta, uh, whereas the consumer of the platform is not going to know everything about their own preferences. So that's why they might need the platform. 
uh, they're going to observe an informative signal that I will not model. Rather, I will just tell them that a consumer is born with a posterior belief about their type, um, MIJ, that's the posterior mean that you have on your theta IJ. And these um, Ms are distributed, um, again, independently with uh, distribution G. Okay? So all that really matters for now is that a consumer is born with a vector of beliefs. Those beliefs are marginal distribution G. Of course, F is the distribution of the truth. So it's a mean preserving spread of G. Okay? And for now, we'll assume that they have the same support so that, uh, so that our life uh, is easier. So again, one minus lambda consumers, they're going to buy based on these uh, Ms. Lambda consumers are going to access the platform. And as I will tell you in a second, they're going to learn their type perfectly through information that the platform gives them. The platform tells me my type if I use it uh, and runs a second price auction for a single advertising sponsored product type of uh, link. What does it mean to um, run a second price auction for advertising? Well, it means that each theta vector is a targeting category. Okay, So the sellers or advertisers can condition their bids on the true type of the consumer, or, diff or put differently, there's a different auction uh, run on the complete information for each consumer type. Not only the bids can condition on the consumer's type, but also the offers and the prices that each consumer um, might receive by the winning bidder can be conditioned on the true type. Off the platform, I'm just going to have a uh, simple classic diamond story. So. Uh, might as well assume it now, but, but it will be easy to get it as part of a result, that consumers with beliefs M, they face search costs, they search, they visit um, uh, directly the seller that uh, they think they have the highest value for. Yeah. What's important here is that the platform is really useful in terms of telling us about our preferences and what we like and what we don't like. So I am going to shut down any experience good type of or inspection good type of element. So it's not like by visiting a seller, I can learn my type for that seller, I need the platform's data to refine my, um, my information. What's the timing? To be a little bit more formal and to capture the idea of automated bidding for uh, online slots. Uh, first, the sellers are going to simultaneously set their off-platform menus. Okay? When I'm off the platform, I see a consumer coming. I, I don't know who they are. So I'm going to offer a Musa Rosen style uh, quality schedule. Um, next, the platform is going to reveal uh, the type of a consumer participating on the, on the platform to all buyers and sellers. Sellers place their bids. Uh, the winning seller can then offer uh, a single product of a given quality QJ, the given price PJ, uh, to the consumer of type theta that they just won the right uh, to advertise to. Now, where do these two on and off platform worlds interact? Is that after receiving this offer and learning their type, the consumer can also turn around and buy off the platform from any seller. In equilibrium, they'll think about buying from the winning seller, but in principle, they're, uh, they're unrestricted from uh, in that sense. Okay. So uh, let me go PowerPoint for just one second. Yeah. So, so they learn their theta. They don't, they don't stick with their M after. Right, no, so, so, so exactly. Think of M, the theta as being the truth. So once I learn my theta, my, my earlier type is gone, okay? It's, uh, it's strictly more information. Okay, but all I've seen really is one product offer, right? Well, think about, you know, Am you know the, the size of a page on Amazon, okay, or, or on Google. I, I, I have a bunch of organic links and then other sponsor stuff, and, and I can learn about what I like. And in particular, there's one in the model here. There's one slot that, that has been paid for and that, that I, can, I okay. can click. Okay. But it, 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 thank you for asking that. And it is important that um, you know, part of what the platform is doing is directly telling me about my preferences. This is not by showing me a, uh, a ski jacket and me then exploring and learning, figuring out my value. It's really there is an organic part of, uh, of the story. So here is a search pattern that can happen, just, just to clarify ideas. Um, here's a consumer at the top with beliefs um, M about their type, uh, with probability one minus lambda exogenously for now, they're going to buy offline, say their highest belief is for firm one, so they can either buy from the offline menu of firm one, let me denote that by a nonlinear tariff P 
one nod for offline of q one from firm one or, or they cannot buy and that's pretty much it but if instead they're in the lambda group that uses the platform they're going to learn their true theta that's strictly more informative than m so that's all that matters now and they might find out that actually firm two is the is the one that they like the most or either way firm two won the auction uh, of course i'll tell you about that and now the consumer can accept the spot offer that firm two is going to make them um P2 or theta two, Q2 or theta two, or they can buy nothing, or they can buy from the offline menu of in fact any firm, but presumably of firm two. Now that they've learned that they would have made the wrong choice had they not visited the platform first, they can go to the um, own website of this reseller and see what they have there in stock. Of course, they're gonna see more than one product there because they will be at this point indistinguishable from. One thing that I didn't get, Alessandro, uh, yeah. does the for uh, consumer, each consumer must buy only one unit? Yes, call it. Uh, yeah, think of Q as quality. Yes, they have unit demand. Unit demand. Uh, okay. Yes, and and theta is the is the marginal value of quality. Yes. So so it really looks like you know, it, absent the platform or with complete information with complete information uh, on the consumer side and no search frictions, it will be a a, um, a model of competing nonlinear prices. But but it's it's going to turn out to be slightly different with um, differentiated products and unit demand. All right, so this is what can happen. This is what the platforms actually. Let me stay on this picture for a little more longer. Um, the platform can provide value by, you know, telling me that I would have visited the wrong firm had I not tried with the platform first. It can also monetize because now firm two gets to learn my type after winning the auction and make me a um, a spot offer. It's not quite take it or leave it because I can go and visit their own website, but uh, but they can make me a targeted offer. That's where the the product steering component comes. Okay, so let me talk through the main forces a little more. Um, on the platform, each seller knows the consumer type. Conditional on winning the auction, you know, there is no adverse selection there. So it's a result, but let me put it up there, that the high bidder is going to offer a single product of the socially efficient uh, quality level. There's no reason to uh, destroy surplus at that stage. Now off the platform, each firm J is going to face a distribution of uh, consumers and those are the consumers that value Jay's product the most based on their M beliefs, but they don't know who's who, so they must elicit this private information. They're going to offer a tariff. Now, a natural candidate for this tariff would be the um, Musa Rosen uh, tariff for distribution G to the J, which is the distribution of the highest order statistic of M that you're going to face in equilibrium um, offline. Yeah. But it's easy to see that that sort of static and standard optimal uh, Musa Rosen menu is not gonna be the optimal one because there is a shadow cost of providing information rents to the off-platform consumers, which is that you're creating an outside option for all of these consumers that you face on the platform after winning the auction for them, and who then have the option of um, showrooming and you know, learning about themselves on the platform, jumping off and buying somewhere else. Okay, so the, the more quality you provide off the platform, the higher the information rents are, as in every standard model, but that also is going to make buying offline more attractive. Okay. So let me go a, a little more formally. Um, there is no price discrimination, uh, strictly speaking, or, or personalized pricing online. There is product steering where I see a different theta. I, in fact, I bid for a different theta, and if I win, um, I get to offer them a different product of a different queue, of course, at a different price, and with a continuum of consumers and uh, regular distributions, no two types will get uh, the same offer. Now, what's the showrooming constraint that I uh, alluded to for the winning bidder is that if I am J and I win the auction for Tita, uh, the utility that I leave to consumer uh, uh, type Tita, so Tita Q minus P, well, that has to be more than whatever this consumer can get um, by buying from me offline. Okay. We'll construct an equilibrium where this is sufficient to guarantee that the consumer accepts this offer, but for sure it's necessary. Right? So, so at least this is a concern, uh, a constraint on the consumer's uh, choice. Then again, if off the platform I am offering an incentive compatible menu, a type theta, it would choose the offer, you know, we 